So over the last three weeks, we've been talking about Solomon and his wisdom. In the first week, we heard about how Solomon asked God for wisdom in a dream, and God was so impressed that he hadn't asked for fame and power, that he gave him fame and power anyway, but he also gave him a healthy dose of wisdom. And last week, we heard about the Proverbs, which Solomon is believed to have written, and the ways in which wisdom can be a blessing for those who are rich, but also a blessing for those who are enduring hard times. And the other thing which Solomon is famous for is building the temple, the very first temple dedicated to God. King David wasn't allowed to build it, although he did recover the Ark of the Covenant, but Solomon built this massive temple under God's instructions. It was spectacular. The, it was mostly built of cedar and stone, the cedar procured from the forests of Lebanon to the north, And it had entire rooms coated in gold. It contained an artificial pond made of bronze that held 44,000 liters of water. The temple was huge and considered one of the wonders of the world. Solomon had gone all out for God. But the Bible tells us that as Solomon built the temple, he also caused problems. He pushed too hard on the northern kingdoms. He conscripted tens of thousands of people into forced labor and made slaves of people who weren't Israelites in the the land of Israel. He taxed them too much. He set out to do good, but he went too far. He created enmities with his people, which became real problems later on when his son was put in power. And we hear that the same sort of excess happened in his love life, too. It was normal back then for kings to marry the princesses of neighboring nations so as to create power alliances. No one wanted to attack you if they knew that you were married to their daughter. So Solomon married a princess of Egypt, but he didn't stop there. We're told that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Women, wealth, power, fame, Solomon had it all, but God was not impressed. Solomon the wise was living out of proportion. He was respected by his subjects, even revered. Foreign leaders like the Queen of Sheba from Africa came to visit him. But the wise king who had the respect of his followers and of foreign nations had gone too far. As we heard in today's reading, God calls him to account, telling him that he shouldn't trust the faith of his wives. Solomon has lost sight of what God wants and of what wisdom in a ruler looks like. But how can this be? Solomon, we're told, is the wisest ruler Israel ever had, and yet he gets in trouble with God? How can a wise king fail? His followers loved his wealth. They admired his power and his harem of women. Women. But he was living dangerously out of proportion, and that will become a major problem. As I mentioned, his son will inherit his kingdom, but a civil war will break out and tear Israel in two. The kingdoms of the north, which he exploited, will break away. The United Kingdom of Israel that his father David had created will end. All of this because of the actions of the one everyone called the wise king. So how can rulers be wise and still come to disaster? Well, we're living through that kind of contradiction right now in our own time. Our country, Canada, is considered one of the most civilized places on earth. We're a magnet for immigrants and students and refugees from all over the world. In 2021, 17,000 people all over the world were asked to rank the world's nations and Canada came out to be number one. A study of Google searches found that Canada is the place that people search for and want to move to the most. And why not? We have a great education system, our healthcare system is wonderful, our politics are certainly more stable than our neighbors to the south, certainly more civil. We also have a beautiful country with mountains and prairies and forests, seas and lakes. We and the world consider us to be a success story. 
we're wise in their eyes and in our own. But you know, we're number one in other ways too. When global surveys measure how much greenhouse gas each person emits on average, for most of the last 20 years, Canadians have been in first place. Here's a graph that shows how we compare to other countries. That's us up at the top of the graph. Per person, we put more greenhouse gases in the air than the Americans, the Chinese, and the British. In Britain's case, we put out three times as much per person. We rely on fossil fuels for our cars, for our heating, and in some places for our electricity. The biggest share of our emissions comes from the vehicles we drive, the energy we burn, and the way we produce oil and gas. How could we be the world's worst so often? After all, we signed the Paris Climate Accord in 2015, the one that aims to dramatically reduce carbon emissions worldwide. This is the same accord that Donald Trump said he wanted to get the Americans out of, and yet we were in it. So surely we're the good guys here. In 2015, when that accord was signed, Canada's Minister of the Environment was the Honourable Catherine McKenna. She led the Canadian delegation to Paris, and she made sure that we signed it. She's a dedicated advocate for the environment. Yet, three weeks ago, she announced that she's leaving politics. She says that she wants to spend more time with her children. And she's also tired of all the online and in-person threats which she receives on a regular basis because of her opposition to climate change. She has been repeatedly accosted in person while out with her children in public. Now she has a security detail with her most of the time, something which cabinet ministers in Canada don't usually have. But she needs them so that she can be protected from being attacked here in Canada because she is trying to protect the environment. Here's a quote that she, that she gave when she, decided, when she announced that she was leaving politics. This is a critical year for climate action in the most important decade that will decide whether we can, we can save the only planet we have. I want to spend my working hours helping to make sure that we do. Think about that for a moment. Here in Canada, a minister of the federal government is being hounded out of office by verbal abuse in person and abuse online, often very sexist abuse. That's the sort of thing that you expect to hear about in countries like Mexico, where drug cartels are constantly trying to intimidate members of the government, but not here. And one of the things that she said was that she thought that she could be more practical, more effective in fighting climate change outside of the government than inside of it. But why is it that she's reached that conclusion? That seems like an odd thing to say. Well, the problem is that for all our talk, Canada is not actually making much progress in reducing our greenhouse emissions. Here's a graph of our total emissions since the year 2000. As you see, we went up quite a bit for the first decade of the millennium. Then we came down to where we are now, which is pretty much the same place where we were in the year 2000. As far as nature is concerned, we're just as bad as we ever were. And you know what? It's not like that everywhere. In Europe, where they take the Paris Accord very, very seriously and they want to meet its targets, they've been changing the way people live. Cities are being redesigned so that cars, a major source of emissions, are locked out from the downtown core. In Barcelona, city planners are, cre are creating massive nine-block areas that are off-limits to cars most of the time. So see, uh, all nine blocks worth of apartment buildings where it's really hard to get there by car. New bike lanes and transportation routes are being set up so that no one will be further than 300 meters from a bus stop. They really want to take cars off the grid. In London, carbon-emitting cars 
are charged an electronic toll of 15 pounds each time they enter the downtown core. In Toronto terms, that would be like spending $25 just because you went south of Eglinton or St. Clair. And if you have a car that is on the older side and sends out a fair bit of emissions, you get an extra charge for that too. But you get a break if you're an electric car. And then, of course, after you've paid that $25, just by having passed by an electronic eye, there's no physical toll, just an eye takes a picture of your license plate and knows that, okay, you would owe $25 for driving downtown. And then, of course, you'd have to pay for parking. And in other European cities, traffic engineers have actually gone through the downtown core and re-timed the stoplights to make it as difficult and frustrating as possible for a car to drive downtown. Meanwhile, here in Canada, we build pipelines to export more oil and gas to the rest of the world. The volume of oil and gas that we export in terms of its potential carbon emissions is roughly equal to the amount of carbon emissions our entire country puts up into the air each year. It's like we're a family that's decided to give up smoking, but we open a tobacco farm so we can make money by selling cigarettes to people at, in the other houses in our neighborhood. And our reasoning is, well, they don't have to smoke the cigarettes, but we want them to buy them. Like Solomon, we Canadians are living out of proportion. We're one of the most educated, most civilized nations on earth. Yet we have founded our economy on the use and export of the one material that we know is poison to the planet. And while other countries try to change their ways, our provincial leaders try to get out of carbon taxes, and our cabinet ministers need security details to protect them from the public. So what should we do? In the scripture reading we heard today, God pays Solomon a visit to set him right. God tells Solomon he's been sinning by worshipping the false gods of his foreign wives. He's disappointed in Solomon. He should have known better. And Solomon did, even if his admiring subjects did not. Solomon knew that to rule human beings requires, to rule wisely requires more than just keeping them fed and entertained. God asks for something more. In the Proverbs, which we are told Solomon wrote, there are a few sections where wisdom speaks about who she is. As we heard last week, she beckons people into her house to learn the wise path of living. But there are also sections in chapter 8 of Proverbs where she explains that she was with God when the universe was created, right at the very beginning. She was like a cross between an architect and a master builder, helping to set the planets into motion, put the stars into their courses, and species and ecosystems into place. Here's what she says. I was there when the Lord set the heavens in place, when God marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when God established the clouds above, and fix securely the fountains of the deep. When God gave the sea its boundary, so the waters would not overstep the divine command. And when God marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was constantly at God's side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in the holy presence, rejoicing in God's whole world, and rejoicing and delighting in humanity. These passages occur early in Proverbs, so they set the stage for all the wisdom Proverbs to come. The Bible is telling us that there is order and wisdom built into the physical universe itself. It operates based on a sense of proportion and balance, which is dynamic. And that's something that our ecologists have been discovering over the last two centuries, something that Darwin noticed in the 19th century. The reason this view of wisdom in Proverbs is in there is because the people who wrote the Bible wanted us to understand that
that wisdom is not just about human morality and ethics. It's not enough for us to have ethical rules and moral standards that keep our society together because our society doesn't live in a bubble. Rather, wisdom is a way of living that permeates the natural order in which our human wisdom is meant to align with. In this approach, if human wisdom is at odds with the wisdom of the universe, then it isn't really wisdom at all. Indigenous people understand this. When they speak of making plans, they say that the plan must work for all of our relations. I first heard this at a national, uh, national meeting of the United Church, which was held in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, some years ago. It was held in a hockey arena. There were tables everywhere on the floor, and there was an echoing PA system where it was hard to hear things. And as often happens in hockey arenas, everything was made of that gray cement. The floor was gray, the walls were gray, the stands were gray. It was just gray, gray, gray. It was a kind of grim, artificial place to spend five days under blaring, beaming fluorescent lights and talking about church policy, which is not always the most fascinating thing that you can spend your time talking about. But one afternoon, there was a motion made about the church's relationship to the rest of the country. And one of the indigenous members of the United Church stood up and said, the motion should be amended to include, include the words, all our relations. She didn't mean all of our uncles and aunts and grandparents and grandkids. Instead, she meant all our relations, the moose, the caribou, the beaver and the muskrat, the raccoons, the trees, the waters. For her indigenous culture, decisions about human affairs had to include all of her relations, which meant everything in the natural world. Indigenous people in Canada never had cities as big as ours, so it's not as simple as just taking what they did in their small villages and scaling it up. But the principles that they have are sound and aligns for what wisdom calls for in the Proverbs. Human ways of living need to be consistent with the wisdom which is built into the natural world. We have to take the natural world's needs into account to make major decisions. For the past 200 years, since the Industrial Revolution, we've acted as though human ethics and ecology could be strangers, completely separate from each other. We've worshipped the idea of constant growth and measured human worth by material wealth. These have been our modern gods, our idols. We've married these ideas and worshipped their values rather than God's call for human wisdom and God's own natural wisdom to be aligned. These idols of ours of constant growth take everything that we give them, and yet the result is not greater equality or justice and prosperity, but growing inequality among our people and increasing environmental disasters. When God speaks to Solomon... The conversation takes place in a language that he can understand. And God doesn't mince words. God tells Solomon that because he's been following false gods, there will be consequences. Now, in our time, nature does not speak in human languages. Nature doesn't talk in English. She expresses her hurt and frustration in heat domes that sit over B.C. and the Northwest. For a day this month, Canada was the hottest place on Earth. Nature's words come in wildfires that can destroy a town like Linton in just a few hours. Her anguish comes in the wind, in hurricanes, and in tornadoes like the one that tore through Barrie a few days ago. And her distress comes across not in tears, but in floods, like the ones that have swept through Germany and Belgium, which scientists are saying haven't happened in 500 to 1,000 years. We can expect to hear more of these messages as long as we continue our worship of wealth and constant growth, freedom bought 
with airborne carbon. The ancient Israelites knew that God cared about nature as much as God cared about human beings. At the end of that world-destroying flood, God makes a promise to never do it again, but the promise is not just made to Noah and his family and humanity. We're told that the covenant is made with the animals too. When Jesus tries to explain human ethics to his followers, he says that all of Solomon's wealth and fine clothes cannot compare to the beauty of the lilies of the field. We are taught that God expects us to live in concert with the rest of creation. We forgot that approach. But for the sake of our children, we need to rediscover it. Human ethics and ecology need to come together again. Politicians need to know that they can get elected even if they oppose carbon corporations because the humans who are suffering the consequences want a different way. When God comes to Solomon, he doesn't punish the wise, lavish king. Instead, he tells him that it will be his children who pay the price. That doesn't seem very fair, but sometimes that's how it works. Let's try to do better than this Bible story. Let's not punish our children and our grandchildren for our folly. It's not too late to wise up. We know the path that we need to take. Let's try it. God will be with us, and so will wisdom. Thanks be to God. Amen.